Alrighty, we'll go ahead and uh, go ahead and get started. Thanks all coming for coming back after lunch. Um, we've got a couple of talks coming up now about open power and uh, a very very small plug for the architecture. If you'd like a sticker, which is about all we're able to manage swag wise, they're out on the uh, the swag table down to the left. Or come and come and find me. We can help you help you out. Um, I'll without further ado, I'll introduce Anton Blanchard to talk about microwave. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, wow. Well, well, thank you. Uh, I'll start by pointing out that I am not and have never been Michael Newling. He was meant to give this talk. Uh, he's been shipped off to the US uh, for important business. So uh, I drew the short straw and have to present both uh, back to back. So the first uh, presentation, we're going to talk a bit about MicroWatt. I'm going to lead in by explaining a bit uh, about what we've done over the last couple of months. Uh, uh, Power is an architecture that's been around for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, We've used it for a number of things. Uh, just recently, we've built, uh, that's number one, and uh, that's number two, the top two fastest supercomputers in the world. Uh, they were both Power9 based uh, clusters. Hey. Um, and I, I mean, one thing I will point out, uh, and, and he's been talking about a, lot, a lot about open power, but a lot of this stuff is all open, uh, and especially, especially the software side. So if we look at one particular thing here, uh, our boxes and indeed the supercomputers run an open source firmware stack. And so we're looking at uh, open source components you can get on GitHub, and they're used uh, uh, on our server boxes, but also used uh, you know, on our supercomputers as well. So we've been doing a lot of work around opening up our software stack over the last years. Uh, and it, as we came to that stage, we were running out of things to open source. Uh, and so uh, this was yet another step that, that has happened over the last couple of years. There is a nice developer workstation, Raptor take our Power9 boxes and they, uh, they put it up uh, into a, a desktop system so you can have a native development environment if you want to. Again, it uses the same open source uh, components, so the open source firmware stack as well. Uh, what happened in August? So in August, as I said, we're running out of things to open source. What are we going to do? We're going to open source the hardware. That was the next logical step. Uh, and so in August, we went out uh, with an announce, and there are a few things behind it. Uh, one of them was the instruction set is now open. And so basically, you can implement uh, royalty-free, inclusive of patents. There's a patent grants that goes with it, but you can implement the power architecture. So you go off and build a, in a better box, you can go off and build in a supercomputer if you want. Uh, you're allowed to do it now. Uh, one thing I want to point out, what's power? Power is PowerPC, PPC, PPC64, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's more or less the same thing now. It's the power architecture. Uh, the Open Power Foundation, as you said earlier, is now moving inside the Linux Foundation. Uh, and one other thing we did, uh, as all of this. This was a great announcement. This was interesting. Inside IBM, we thought, well, you've got to come up with something. You've got to show something. And with a couple months to spare, we didn't have time to stand up you know, one of our existing cores or something like that. So we went away and said, well, let's build something. How hard could it be? Uh, uh, and we had a couple months to do it. So uh, we got there. Uh, it wasn't real pretty, but we got there. We announced. Uh, it ran. Uh, and we called it MicroWatt. And so that was basically in August. What is MicroWatt? Well, it's a tiny power core. It uses what we call the uh, OpenISA scalar fixed point subset. So it's not all the Power9 instructions. Having said that, the instructions that it does implement are the Power9 64-bit base architecture. So it's the same instructions that are running on all our other servers. It's written in VHDL 2008. Uh, it uses GHDL, which is an open source simulation environment. Uh, and it's available on GitHub. Very simple, single issue. It's in order. The aim is to be simple and easy to understand. Uh, I'm not going to go to detail on, on this, uh, Paul, in a subsequent presentation, is going to run through some of the, the nuts and bolts of the microarchitecture. But it looks like a, a very normal risk pipeline that you'd learn at university. It's very simple. Uh, the other thing we did is we used a bunch of open hardware uh, that uh, we could find, so we didn't need to reinvent the wheel. And so things like UARTs and DRAMs and stuff like that we picked up from the open hardware community. And let's talk a bit about language support. So uh, one thing that's been great is, is we leverage the software stack that already exist, exists for power. So a lot of stuff just works. Uh, the tool chain, all my tool chain, all the work I do uses the standard distro tool chain, whether it be a cross compiler from Fedora or a, uh, a native environment on one of our Raptor boxes, I don't have to do anything to the tool chain. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we have been adding platform support. So obviously, 
you know, stuff that isn't running in Linux, if it's running on a bare metal system, it needs some platform support. Uh, and we've had uh, some help from a number of people, uh, including uh, Mikey, Jordan, and, and more recently Tom for some of that. So some of the stuff that we run. We started off with MicroPython. Anyone heard of MicroPython before? Cool, most people. Um, it's great. It's a real simple little Python interpreter, really easy to get going. Uh, the port wasn't too difficult, and um, a couple months ago, Mikey actually got that upstream. So MicroPython just works. What's next? Zephyr. Zephyr sounded like the logical step. Uh, so we got Zephyr going a couple months ago as well, and that's just a very small microkernel. Uh, it was interesting. I've looked at microkernels before. It looks very Linuxy. I guess that's the aim. Easy to work with. Uh, Mikey and I play with it and got it going pretty quickly. Uh, and again, now that runs on MicroWatt. What's next? Uh, just last week, someone popped up and said, here's Rust support. Um, fantastic. And so that came in last week. Uh, and most of the work there was actually adding a couple of instructions that we hadn't bothered to implement. Long story. But anyway, the instructions got implemented. And now Rust works. That's fantastic. Um, and then at that stage, we're missing something really important, apparently. Uh, one of our people in Canberra came along and gave us fourth support. So now we have fourth <laughs> support. I don't understand it, but great. Um, I guess now we're legitimate. We have fourth. Some of the more recent developments we have. Uh, we got Fusoc support really early. I don't know if anyone, has anyone worked with vendor FPGA tools before? A bit, yes, yeah, some people. Uh, they're pretty painful to use. Uh, they're built around GUIs and all this kind of stuff that doesn't really work in, in, a, in, a, in a world where we're, in, we're much more on the command line on the software side of things. Uh, Olaf turned up pretty much on the first day we released it and said, no, 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 here's Fusoc, here's my project, and here's it all uh, merged, merged in, uh, here's a merge request, a pull request, and, and uh, it's made our lives so much easier. It's been fantastic. Uh, Ben has uh, worked with Florent on Light DRAM. There's a bunch of good stuff going on around um, um, FPGA-based components. And so uh, Ben and Florent were able to plug that together so we have DRAM support without actually having to implement an entire DRAM controller. That's fantastic. Uh, we've been working a lot with Tristan. And so uh, one of the things uh, in the open hardware world is, is that VHDL doesn't get as much love as Verilog. And um, you may not know what either of them are. They're just two different languages. And the problem is, is that uh, some companies and some parts of the world like to use one language and others like to use the, uh, another. So VHDL is big in Europe, big inside IBM. Verilog is big inside other companies and the US. Uh, so we've been working with Tristan to try and um, improve the situation on VHDL. It's getting, uh, on GHDL, uh, it's been getting much, much better. Um, synthesis, we'll talk a bit about synthesis a bit later, but synthesis is basically taking your design and getting it on the FPGA, all those steps. Uh, and that's coming along uh, very well. I was hoping we'd get it done by today, but it's not quite. Uh, so you should have a completely open source VHDL flow, uh, which is, is going to be great for a lot of people. Uh, we've got a debug interface, a JTAG debug interface, again, thanks to Ben. Um, a divider, we went out without a divider. Again, smoke and mirrors. Uh, it didn't need a divider. I could get away with it to, to get out the announce in August. We quickly needed one, and so Paul, uh, Paul added that for us. Uh, iCache and Dcache, Ben again, th thank you. Uh, I've done a bit of pipelining over the last uh, month. And um, one other thing, I think Paul most, I, I say single-handedly, I think you more, more or less single-handedly halved the, uh, the resource consumption. So when you talk FPGAs, people talk in terms of LUTs. It's just, it's a lookup table, it's, a, it's, it's real estate, how much, how much of that FPGA are you using? And so here's, a, here's a, a thing of our LUT usage over time, and this is when Paul really got into it. So we went from about 12,000 of these LUTs down to 6,000. So he halved our core. Uh, not surprising, so one of the ways that we got out in only two months was we applied an inverted comm as a software tech, a software uh, view of the world in terms of building hardware. So we, we burned through resources. But the idea was, let's build it fast, let's get it out the door, and let's iterate once it's out the door. Uh, and so that's what we did. And so very quickly, Paul was able to realize that we've duplicated stuff all over the place, halved our resource consumption. Now we're down at the, you know, the, the 5,000 to 6,000 LUTs. So we're not as small as Risk v We're not huge. It runs on small FPGAs. It runs on reasonably small um, Xilinx FPGAs. So it's not too bad. More recent developments. Um, Tim's been helping us along the way uh, with all his knowledge uh, in the world. We've added um, some CI, which has been good. So uh, again, the software view of the world, we're very big on testing, on CI, on test cases, unit tests, and all that kind of stuff, and I think that helps a lot. 
Uh, as I said, part of Rust, we got CR Logicals last week, fantastic. Uh, Mikey did the MicroPython. Uh, I worked with Mikey on Zephyr. Uh, we had fourth from Jordan, thank you, Jordan. Um, and Rust was Tom. So a lot going on. We've been out only a couple months and there's a lot happening. It's, uh, it's been pretty exciting. People ask any bugs. Of course, there are no bugs at all. Um, that was a particularly interesting bug. We managed to output everything twice, uh, but otherwise completely functional. Fantastic. <laughs> next question is, yes, <laughs> the next question. Why do we do this? You know, uh, and people have asked this question before. Well, I view it, I view it myself in a few ways. One of them is diversity is good. I mean, I work on Linux every day, and I think Linux is the best way to do a lot of things, but we're not always right. And if I look at security, I look across at OpenBSD and some of the stuff happening there, I think they're doing a lot of things better than Linux is. In the same respect, I think power brings another interesting architecture to the open hardware world. I think uh, we'll be able to work together on some things and we'll, we'll do better at some things. Risk five will do better at others. And so I do think diversity is important in the open hardware world. Uh, the other thing on my side, I like the ability to leverage what we already have. So as I said, we haven't had to do any tool chain work. Just, it's just there. Um, we're pulling either cross compilers from the distros or using our native environments with Fedora and um, Debian and SUSE and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the other thing is, is there's, there's actually a lot of love out there for PowerPC. So we've manned the booth. This is us doing the, you know, the road trip with, uh, with the announce, uh, Hugh and I. Uh, there's been a lot of people coming up saying, we used to develop power and, and you know, we built products on it. We like it. It's great to see it back. Um, that's cool. And so there's an interesting community out there that, uh, that hopefully we can, we can tap into. Finally, it's fun. I've had a ball. It's been a lot of fun. I know some other people who work with me had fun too. Um, we're mostly uh, software people and you know, getting involved in hardware and having, uh, having a bit of a ball at, at, at playing with you know, the other side of the fence. Um, I'll just mention very quickly what we got right, maybe, and what we got wrong. Um, we, did, we did a lot of testing to start with, such that when we stood it up, uh, we were confident that it would work. So we, we, we did a lot of testing around instruction level, uh, instruction level testing and all that kind of stuff, uh, a lot of random execution testing, getting a CI going very early. So basically every commit that we put is tested, at least in some part. Uh, and we had you know, a combination of different workloads, yeah, MicroPython as well as random execution tests. What we got wrong, um, yeah, we limped, limped along without a, a hardware divide. I, I was just lazy and, and didn't want to implement it. Thankfully, Paul helped us there and, and fixed that. Um, and, and the problem was, was things just would sometimes fail if you weren't using you know, the right flags and the right tool chain. Um, early on, we, we weren't necessarily simulating everything, so we had a few issues where things would simulate, but they wouldn't actually run on the FPGA, and we've got past that as well. Uh, another thing is, is that, um, yeah, we, we, we got our area under control, but it, it, it maybe happened later than we should have. Uh, Yosis, which is the open, um, part of the open source synthesis tools, really nice. So we're, we're really um, enjoying, well, I'm enjoying using it to kind of look at how expensive things in, how, how, how expensive they are, how much real estate it takes, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, those open source tools have been, uh, have been really good. Some of the next steps. Uh, we really want to get on top of Yosis and NextPNR. So as I said, that's the open source synthesis tools. Uh, we're close. Uh, Tristan, who maintains GHDL, has been fixing a bunch of bugs for us, and probably in the next couple of weeks we'll have that going. And so I think that's a big deal to uh, the community in general to have a, an adequate way to synthesize VHDL projects uh, with a completely open source tool. We'd like to add some more supervisor state, get Linux going, an FPU maybe, or uh, as Paul suggests, maybe just enough FPU state that we can effectively, uh, or efficiently, I should say, emulate it. Uh, and then maybe another language. So that's a VHDL language, maybe Verilog, maybe even Chisel could be interesting. Finally, um, come join us. We're having fun. Uh, there's a lot to do. Um, especially on the hardware side. So, you know, as I said, we're at the opposite problem. We have a fairly established software ecosystem, but we have a pretty, uh, pretty immature and new hardware ecosystem, at least when it comes to open hardware. So there's a lot of space to play, you know, um, instructions to be, to be added and all that kind of stuff. And um, that's it. And I'll move on to my second talk. So this is the talk I was meant to give, and uh, I will give it. Um, and um, what's that? Yes. 
Does it have a MMU? It doesn't at the moment. We're talking about efficient ways to kind of add it without having to add uh, the entire architecture that we have at the moment. It, it, it wouldn't be a hash table, no, no, and, and maybe a software load to start with, and then looking at maybe maybe something Radix related, but we haven't we haven't quite got there yet. <laughs>